Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. In the show today, we speak exclusively to former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense and Project 2049 Chairman Randall Shriver. Mr. Shriver was also former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He was responsible for China, Taiwan, Mongolia, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. Our exclusive interview covers a new era of great power competition and Washington's 2022 cancellation of symmetric weapons systems to Taiwan. Secretary Shriver, welcome to Taiwan Talks. Thank you very much. I understand that the reason why you are back in Taiwan is because of the passing of democracy fighter Ku Kuangming. In your message, you talked about the mentorship that he offered. Can you tell us about your relationship with him? Well, he was a mentor, and despite the generational difference, I also considered him a friend. But uh, I learned a lot from him about Taiwan's history and about the struggle here for democracy and the emergence of Taiwanese identity. Uh, and he was somebody who, despite his passion on, on these issues, was also quite open-minded and willing to engage in discussion on any topic. Um, so he's somebody I admired a great deal, and uh, he was instrumental in the founding of our Institute Project 2049. Uh, so I thought it was the, the absolute right thing to do to come and pay respects and, and mark this uh, important passing. Mm. Tell me a bit more about the foundational role or, or contribution that he made to Project 2049. Well, he helped us with resources to get off the ground. Um, we discussed the ideas we had about the Institute, the kind of work we wanted to do. And uh, one of the interesting things about him is uh, I wouldn't say we were 100% aligned, but he believed in the vision enough and the people enough that he was willing to invest, and he, he continued to be an advisor to us. China's foreign minister and leader Xi Jinping have both spoken about U.S. containment, encirclement, suppression, and also a distorted view of China. And Qinggang has warned that if the U.S. doesn't change course, then this could end in conflict and confrontation. So is China a victim here? Well, we should be working hard to avoid conflict. It would be extraordinarily costly for all parties involved and, and, and those uh, on the periphery. So uh, it's unfortunate that he's describing the current state of, of, of affairs and the trajectory, that one that could lead toward conflict. But look, I've worked in and, in and out of administrations for about 30 years, and we more often than not have leaned forward with engagement. We've more often than not leaned forward in trying to bring China into the international and regional fora. We've tried to be supporters of China's success economically, look at the levels that we trade with them, look at the trade deficits that we uh, bear, look at the amount of Chinese students who train in our institutions of higher learning, particularly in science and, and engineering. This is hardly a, a recipe for containment. The fact of the matter is, more recently, China's behavior has become more assertive and they have been behaving in ways that are a threat to the free and open order in the region, and we have to respond to that. And by the way, it's not just the United States, it's the United States and other countries, which is why they may have this feeling of encirclement, but it's really a reflection that their own behavior is really driving countries to do things to try to promote the free and open order in, in this environment. Mm. Do you see um, those comments as almost, could they be seen as a false flag narrative, sort of, uh, you know, the U.S. has pushed us into this? Because they are the ones that are talking about conflict. Yeah, I, I don't know what's motivating these particular comments. They do tend to blame the United States for a lot of problems in the world, including those outside of China. We, in fact, they blame us for the war in Ukraine for pushing NATO expansion and, and threatening Russia's core security interests. So it's not uncommon for us to hear them trying to cast blame on us and trying to play the role of victim. Uh, but I think if you look around the region, again, it's not just the United States. We see pretty strong response throughout the region to China's behavior, which to me suggests more objectively uh, they're a big part of the, the issue right now, their behavior. Mm. Um, some of the comments that Gang has made uh, in relation to the U.S. and the Ukraine war, um, he has said that the U.S. is practicing double standards in defending the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, but not China's claim over Taiwan, and also um, arming Taiwan 
but accusing China of considering arming Russia. Uh, are, these, uh, are these comparable? No, they're false equivalencies. Uh, Ukraine uh, is a sovereign country. Uh, President Tsai has said Taiwan is already a sovereign and independent country under the ROC Constitution, so Beijing has an alternate view on that. But uh, we have every right to partner with Taiwan, provide Taiwan security assistance given the threats that Taiwan faces. And really, I think, who are who, which parties are the aggressor in, in, in each case? Russia is the clear aggressor, unprovoked, uh, tragic uh, invasion. Uh, China is the aggressive party in the cross-strait environment. We see it uh, almost on a daily basis with military intimidation and coercion. So uh, there's another area where this is just a false equivalency. We need to deal with uh, the aggressor, the one that's uh, willing to upset the status quo, the, the one that's willing to uh, risk military conflict through the activities, uh, not, not the peaceful democratic people that have been victimized. Mm -hmm. Does the U.S. see Taiwan as a nation? It, we certainly treat Taiwan as a normal nation in a lot of ways. Of course, we have a diplomatic position that we take as a result of our one China policy, so we don't have a formal diplomatic relationship. Uh, but the nature of our trade, the nature of our security assistant, uh, to an untrained eye, it looks an awful lot like treating it like a nation, yes. Mm. Because I understand that, in fact, the, the U.S. Uh, position was that this is actually an unresolved issue, Taiwan's sovereignty. Well, going back to the communiques and, our, and what formed our one China policy, we never took a position on uh, the, the ultimate outcome of the dispute between the two sides, but we acknowledged the position on the two sides that Taiwan was a part of China. Uh, by the way, the Chinese also made commitments in those agreements, which ultimately led to us adopting a one China policy, to include taking a fundamentally peaceful approach. I don't see that they're doing that right now, so I don't see that we are necessarily bound by everything that we said in those agreements. But I think our position will remain consistent. We've heard from uh, the Biden administration that they won't alter the one China policy. So that's where we are. Mm. And the justification for arming Taiwan? Well, the threats that they face, and we have a law in the United States, the Taiwan Relations Act, which obliges us to do it. It's, it's not a policy choice we make. It's actually a legal obligation. But beyond that, it's our interests. Uh, Taiwan's our uh, eighth largest trading partner in the world, our sixth largest destination for agricultural products. It's a country that shares our values and promotes those uh, values in the international community. Uh, while China is backing Russia in this conflict with Ukraine, Taiwan has been a generous cons uh, contributor to supporting Ukrainian refugees in Poland, for example. I mean, those two case studies side by side to me suggest Taiwan is worth supporting and worth defending what people have worked so hard here to build. Mm -hmm. And why would China provide lethal aid to Russia? Is this to increase their bargaining power when it comes to negotiations? When Xi Jinping and President Putin declared that their relationship was a strategic one with no limits. Xi Jinping was really making a decision that would he'd have to live with almost in perpetuity, that he's in bed with Putin, that this is his most important strategic relationship. And the only thing worse than war in Ukraine for China is Putin losing the war in Ukraine. Then he has no strategic backers, no strategic partners in the world. So I think at a, a strategic level, they can't see Putin fail. And so while there are certainly downsides to those decisions, and, and I think our Secretary of State with uh, Wang Yi in Munich was very clear that there should not be lethal aid to Russia, uh, it's a decision that we understand that they're contemplating, and it would be a mistake. How would the U.S. react if indeed they did? Well, I don't know the full uh, range of, of reaction. Um, I, I would anticipate some economic costs, some sanctioning. Um, we have in, in our Congress a lot of attention on China right now. Most of it is trying to sharpen the tools available to us for cost imposition, to have greater economic security on our side, which means to a certain extent targeted decoupling. So probably a lot of that would be accelerated. Um, I, I don't see that it, it would in any way give us the opportunity to cooperate with China on things that China cares about. So I, I think there would be considerable cost. Mm -hmm. And you're um, a commissioner on the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review. So this sort of work would be exactly the sort of 
advice that you're giving to, to Congress, is that true? That is true. So we've looked at the war in Ukraine and the implications for China, for the region, and uh, have already included some of those thoughts in our last annual report. Uh, but the strategic environment and, and Xi Jinping's choice to back Putin, I think, will have lasting effect. And it's something we continue to look at. This One of the recommendations from our annual report last year was we should look at how to build out potential cost imposition uh, modalities before China makes a disastrous move on Taiwan or something along those lines for the purpose of having deterrent effect. Um, and this was also discussed in the initial Taiwan Policy Act. Yes. Yeah, it's important because deterrence is a psychological effect. And if, if it's not displayed and not credible, then you might miss the opportunity to have that impact. We know the Chinese are looking at the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we see some things in Chinese writings that indicate, well, we're a bigger economy. We're the second largest economy in the world. We have a more diverse economy. Russia's kind of a one-trick pony with oil. Uh, Taiwan doesn't have diplomatic relations, whereas Ukraine was a, a recognized uh, country embraced by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So we need to persuade them uh, that despite all that, the cost would be significant and, and frankly not worth it for China to take uh, a drastic action related to Taiwan. Mm. And, and part of that deterrence that you spoke about um, is obviously Taiwan arming itself. Uh, this, this is also a deterrence. Now, Mike Gallagher of the um, U.S. House Committee on China, he visited Taiwan and then um, returning back, he talked about, you know, the priority is to arm Taiwan to the teeth. Um, but there is a 19 billion U.S. dollar arms backlog. It includes things like harpoons and F-16s. Is there a danger that Taiwan could become a new Ukraine in that the U.S. would only arm Taiwan significantly with the, with the weapons that it actually needs after an invasion? Well, uh, Congressman Gallagher is a serious person and I, I take what he says very seriously, um, particularly given that he was here and had a chance to investigate things firsthand. Uh, I think our track record of supporting Taiwan's defense needs historically is very good. I think we we're not prepared for the, the demand surge given the conflict in Ukraine, and this has created some of the backlog. Uh, I think we need to work on that and, and uh, certainly diminish the, the backlog and the things that Taiwan is waiting for. But we also need to be forward-looking and think about the, the kinds of things that Taiwan needs for the current environment, for counter-coercion. What sort of things do you mean? Well, what the, the form of coercion that we see uh, visibly would be flights across the center line, ships across the center line, uh, bombers circumventing the whole island of, of Taiwan. Um, so those need to be met uh, consistently. Maybe not plane for plane, ship for ship, because Taiwan is a smaller military and is uh, resource constrained. Um, but we can't only think about an invasion scenario and only arm for that and, and not allow coercion to be met in some fashion. Because ironically, not addressing coercion would make the invasion more likely, not less likely. Because the, the Chinese PLA, CCP, tends to push to a point until they meet resistance. If they don't meet resistance, they keep going. And so the coercion will only increase if it's not met uh, with some response. You know, talking about the coercion, or some people might call it gray zone um, tactics. What do you think about the, uh, the limit or the encouragement of the current administration uh, on Taiwan to buy only asymmetric weapons? These are weapons that essentially work once the PLA actually reaches or is not very far from Taiwan's shores. What was your opinion about that? Well, Again, Taiwan faces coercion every day. President Tsai refers to it as cognitive warfare. I think that has to be addressed. And so while I understand the administration wants to prioritize certain capabilities, given the urgency of the threat and the possibility of an invasion, uh, I don't think we can only focus on that scenario, nor is that helpful to Taiwan. Um, there are resource constraints and there are trade-offs. Decisions have to be made and prioritization is wise in a resource constrained environment. But I think the peacetime or the, or, or the gray zone coercion 
uh, scenarios also have to be addressed. And so I, I hope that the administration will support that as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's been said that there's no Ukraine model for Taiwan. So Taiwan would not possibly not be able to be resupplied like Ukraine is being. So if that's the case, what should Taiwan be doing? Taiwan should not be allowing a D-Day invasion, should be doing everything to stop that. That's right. Well, the Ukraine model might look okay post facto when we think about how quick the international community was to respond with cost imposition, sanctions on Russia. But remember, deterrence failed, and Ukraine was invaded, and we have millions of refugees, tens of thousands of people killed. That's not a good model for Taiwan. So you're absolutely right, as your question implies. Uh, Taiwan needs a strong capability to have deterrent effect before the Chinese decide to make that decision to invade, and hopefully one that they never will. And part of that, I think, does mean meeting coercion. Part of that means showing an, a, a resiliency. Uh, in, for the leadership. Uh, one of the things we've learned from Ukraine, I think, is the importance of leadership and, and President Zelensky. You know, if he's on one of the first airplanes out of there, I think the whole thing turns out quite differently. So thinking about continuity of government, uh, persistent and resilient communications, these are all things that can be built now in a peacetime environment. And uh, that would, I think, contribute overall to the deterrent effect. But you're right, the resupply would be different. Um, we need to think about, in a blockade scenario, how you open up corridors and allow for the continued resupply of Taiwan. Uh, how you think about stockpiling, and not just munitions, although that, there's a place for that and needs to be considered, but uh, how many days worth of energy can Taiwan produce if it's cut off from the outside world? Uh, how about food supplies and, and the like? So these are all things that need to be thought up now and thought of up front and fine if that's also known by the PRC, because again, this all sort of builds into a deterrent impact. Do you see that there's a shift underway in the administration's approach to China's information war? Um, we've had the publicity over this special channel um, between Taiwan and, and Washington, and um, also Michael Chase's visit to Taiwan, as well as the U.S.-Taiwan joint troop training, mm. with both in the U.S. and in Taiwan. Well, I think one of Beijing's goals is to isolate Taiwan, to make Taiwan feel as though they are alone and have no alternative other than to capitulate politically. I think for a long time the concern was being too public about these kinds of exchanges might make the situation worse, anger Beijing, provoke them. Provoke them. I think what we've seen is um, they're acting more aggressively without these excuses and without uh, these so-called provocations, although they did uh, massively overreact to Speaker Pelosi's visit here. Um, so I think the idea is we need to be a little more public on some of this so that uh, Taiwan and the, and the people don't feel so isolated. They understand that there are things happening government to government levels, military to military levels, uh, that we're thinking through these challenges and, and we'll be there as a supporter of Taiwan. And in light of this, should President Tsai Ing-wen meet with Speaker Kevin McCarthy in California? rather than in Taiwan? Well, I, I'll, I'll leave it up to President Tsai and, and Speaker McCarthy to figure that out. It does make sense to me if she's transiting uh, the U.S. West Coast uh, next month to visit, I believe it's Guatemala, uh, that uh, a stop in California would be a very traditional stop for a transit. And Speaker McCarthy, what uh, member of Congress wouldn't like to have a, a foreign dignitary visit his district and and uh, you know, make a display for the people of California to see what a leadership role he's playing in foreign policy. So I, I think it's, you know, anytime our leadership can talk to Taiwan's leaders, it's a good thing because we do have so much constraint built into the informal, non-diplomatic relationship. So I encourage it in California, I encourage it in Taiwan, whatever they can work out. Mm. But into the calculus, Tsai won't be received as the president of Taiwan. Well, we don't have a formal diplomatic relationship. Uh, members of Congress do feel less bound by some of those diplomatic formalities. And I would, I would venture a guess that uh, Speaker McCarthy will call her President Tsai when they meet. In your opinion, um, with your years in the Department of Defense, what do you believe will be China's steps if it was to take Taiwan by force? Well, we're seeing a lot of 
coercive activities, and some would suggest that this is a way to not only put political pressure on Taiwan, but to start to test Taiwan's defense, their responses, how they deal with flight intercepts and the like. Uh, so I think there's probably some truth to that, that they're, they're pushing to a point where they get some resistance and they're evaluating uh, the will of Taiwan to really respond and, and defend. Um, I think they've developed certain capabilities that, that we would expect if there were to be more aggressive action, like cyber capabilities. Um, I think they would, they would try to disrupt a lot of uh, what's happening in Taiwan, uh, the, the economy, uh, the sort of regular routine life through cyber effect if they can. I think the reality is that for China to take Taiwan and really exercise sovereign control, they've got to have boots on the ground. They've got to have people who come in, hold and occupy land, and, and really enforce their will over an otherwise unwilling population. So at the end of the day, it's going to require some amount of lift to get probably hundreds of thousands of people across the Taiwan Strait. And that's really been the long pole in the tent for them for a long time. Um, I'm not sure they're capable of doing that at this juncture. You might have seen our CIA director, William Burns, said he doesn't think Xi Jinping has the confidence that he can do this. Mm. Uh, I think that's probably right. It's a difficult task. Mm. And Taiwan, if you look at the, just the basic geography, 80 nautical miles of water, mountainous, inhospitable terrain, uh, unfavorable sea conditions for much of the year, very few ports for embarkation that are favorable, this is a pretty hard target. And this would be for a military that hasn't seen combat since 1979. Mm -hmm. So this is not an easy thing. And I think it should give Xi Jinping pause uh, that uh, they need to be really well sure that they're trained and equipped to do it if they make the decision to go. And I think our job is to make them get up every morning and say, not today, not next week, not next month. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, your, your question it would require some form of boots on the ground and invasion, and that's where uh, we, we have uncertainty to this day. Mm. Given that you said that that would be very difficult to transport all those troops over, uh, you would think that the PLA would be looking at ways to weaken Taiwan before that yes. moment. So maybe missile strikes? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think we would expect cyber. I think if they have made the decision to cross and try to invade, you would see pretty massive missile strikes, uh, primarily military targets, c communications, try to disrupt uh, the continuity of governance here. Mm -hmm. I think we would anticipate all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, really getting enough people across the strait to, to take and hold and occupy land uh, is where they're going to be challenged. And that's where I think Taiwan can do a lot to really increase doubt in the minds of the, the PLA leaders and then ultimately Xi Jinping. What, um, what weapons would Taiwan uh, need to stop or to, to lessen the, the impact, the missiles? We, we have Patriot um, systems. Mm -hmm. Do we have enough? Does Taiwan have enough? There's uh, the calls from one side um, of the debate saying that we, Taiwan, should have the E2D mm -hmm. um, planes, which is the, you know, it can scan, it's got the radar 360 degrees, yes. and it's also command and control system. So why is it that the Biden administration, in your view, has stopped the sale of, of something that could detect and could help uh, in this scenario? Well, it's hard for me to explain a position I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, I think they might have the view that things that are dependent on airfields are more vulnerable during the actual shooting war. And you mentioned missiles being used uh, and the potential for airfields to be taken out. That would lessen the ability to operate a system like the E2D, uh, obviously. But certainly in, in peacetime and coercion scenarios, and, and by the way, interoperability with the United States and Japan, it would be an extremely useful platform. Thing I, the things I was mentioning earlier about how you have a corridor available to run a blockade, E2D again would be very favorable for that. Uh, but look, you also mentioned uh, Mike Gallagher earlier. Uh, I heard Mike Gallagher say not too long ago, look, this isn't complicated. It's not necessarily easy, but it's not complicated. We need to be able to sink a lot of ships. <laughs> and you know, when you look at that equation, how you get people across the Taiwan Strait. It can't be done really through uh, airlift. It just, you can't scale quickly enough to get enough people across the Strait. It has to be ships. 
And so the anti-ship coastal missile systems are very effective. I think the, um, uh, the, and that's a combination of what Taiwan produces indigenously and what it's purchasing from the U.S. Uh, but I think a lot more uh, underwater, including underwater unmanned, could be very helpful. I think a lot of unmanned aerial could be very helpful. Uh, Taiwan is acquiring uh, MQ-9s, which would be helpful for uh, maritime domain awareness, potentially arm those for a more lethal system. But I think even more unmanned, because those are cost effective and, and cheaper to invest in, uh, but in many ways as lethal as, as manned platforms. I think those are the kinds of things that, that could really cause uh, military planners in Beijing to think twice. Mm. And in fact, these drones, U.S. intelligence said that, that Beijing was considering sending to, to Russia for the Ukraine war. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, well, one of the interesting things about the Ukraine war is where's the Russian Air Force? We, we, we don't see it. It's not uh, effectively changing anything on the battle space. And they, one might conclude that they're constrained from effectively using air platforms. So they're, they're looking at unmanned systems, and it would make sense for them to, to ask the Chinese for them. Mm -hmm. To me, that would be crossing a line that the Chinese shouldn't cross, mm -hmm. because that is, if not lethal, not, if not armed, at least lethal enablers. And, and uh, that would be quite unfortunate if China made that decision. So in Taiwan's position, um, given that it believes that there's a need for, say, like the E2D plane, and it can't get that from the U.S., do you think Taiwan should go to other, uh, other countries, perhaps Israel, mm. um, some of the European countries, or would it be constrained by the U.S. again? Mm. Well, I think it's understandable that Taiwan would look for other parties to be able to support capabilities that, that they've identified as requirements. Um, I, I think the reality is the U.S. Is only, has been the only reliable supplier of military equipment for decades now. Uh, if Taiwan were to be able to find other countries to support its military needs, I, I as an American, wouldn't oppose it. I, I don't know what the Biden administration would feel about it. The Taiwanese press, there's been discussions about the, um, the, the depot for uh, storing U.S. arms, a sort of stockpile. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, this conversations have been going on, you know, since the Taiwan Policy Act and, and even before that. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of practical benefits would that bring um, in an, any invasion? Well, it would allow the United States and Taiwan to engage in the fight for a greater sustained period uh, than otherwise would be the case because of the tyranny in time, of time and distance. It, one of the things that will be very challenging for the U.S. in any scenario is to continue to resupply and arm and, and maintain our military in a contested environment. If a portion of that is forward deployed and safe and secure before the fight begins, That'll give you some, some breathing space and some time to be able to sustain the fight without being cut off for fear, for fear of being cut off. Um, it also, I think, is not isolated to Taiwan. We're looking at this all over the region. We're looking at arrangements in the Philippines. We just announced four new military sites uh, through what's called ECTA in the Philippines. Uh, we're looking at it in places like the Pacific Islands. Again, for the U.S., this is a problem of, of time and distance, and so in a contested environment, we're going to want as much of this forward deployed as possible, including in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there might be boots on the ground for U.S. troops? Well, I, I don't want to predict a, a particular scenario and how it would unfold, but I think for Beijing to think about how easily they could take Taiwan, they, they better think about that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, Turning to Russia and China's relationship, now, there's no limits partnership, as you've mentioned, and recently uh, both sides have been talking about deepening, strengthening, advancing their relationship. What sort of challenge does this pose to U.S. global influence? Well, there are two countries that are of like mind about certain things. They're both uh, very opposed to the U.S. and our alliance system. They're opposed to uh, the liberal order and the, the values associated with a free and open order. So that's concerning on its surface. Um, how aggressively they'll push alternatives and, and push countries uh, toward their vision for regional and global order um, is, is to be seen. They're right now pretty uh, tied up with their own internal issues in the case of China, uh, the war in Ukraine in the case of Russia. 
But if they emerge from, from that conflict with some sense of purpose and dedication to altering the, the global order, uh, this is a problem. These are two large countries, well-equipped militaries, countries that are, are very advanced in their thinking on use of information and, and the like. So uh, this is uh, something that, that we should watch very carefully. There's plenty of historical tension between Russia and China. There's plenty of irritants still in the relationship. I can't imagine the Russians are happy about Chinese presence in Central Asia, for example. Uh, I can't imagine the Russians are happy about Chinese icebreakers in the Arctic, for example. There's plenty of reasons for them to have distrust with one another. But at the Xi Jinping, Putin level, they seem to be very locked in for the time being. What do you think that their partnership, their combination, what, is it, um, what threat does it pose to Taiwan? We've heard, uh, you know, on the Russian side, uh, continued uh, statements about that they stand with China, Taiwan is part of China. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in a couple different ways. One is that isolation uh, to the extent that Russia has any influence after this debacle in Ukraine. Um, if they're backing China's position, that will make it more difficult for other countries to stand with Taiwan, stand with the United States. I think the more uh, proximate uh, issue is how the Russians can help Chinese military modernization and capabilities. They continue to, to be some source of, of military uh, technology and know-how, even though Russia is really the, the recipient now of military assistance. Um, and they, they continue to train and exercise. They, they're holding exercises uh, even in, in the midst of this conflict with Ukraine. And so China's trying to get better at certain things, and there are certain things they may be able to learn from the Russians that could apply to a Taiwan contingency, and that's, that's concerning to us. So you mentioned the military exercises um, in South Africa between the three countries, Russia, China, South Africa. Are they, so they're not just shows of force. They're, they're actually, militarily speaking, they are tactical. Yeah, it depends on the exercise. So there are some that look a lot more sort of political messaging. And I think the, uh, the exercise you mentioned with South Africa is probably more in that category of, of signaling and messaging that, that they can walk and chew gum at the same time. They can do this uh, operation, special operation, as they call it, in Ukraine and still uh, have normal uh, military diplomacy and, and activities. But there are other things they do in, in bilateral settings that are more serious and, and to task in terms of preparing the PLA for certain contingencies that are uh, of, of growing concern, I would say. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that if Russia basically stands with China um, in, the, in, the, in the issue over Taiwan's sovereignty, and you said that that would then make it difficult for other countries to support Taiwan and the U.S. Why do you say that? Well, Taiwan has 14 diplomatic relationships in the world. They have an important partnership with the United States. Um, they have growing support from countries like Japan. Uh, but let's face it, it's still pretty limited. And so, again, if Russia has any influence over remaining partner countries at all, and, and I think given the number of countries that abstained in the U UN vote that criticized Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, there's reason to believe they do. Um, this, this would help to isolate Taiwan and further Beijing's interest in trying to keep the conflict limited to an, a, a, as few, a, a number of outside parties as possible supporting Taiwan. And so you're referring to what people like to call the global south, maybe countries in Africa, Middle East, some parts of Asia. Central Asia, the former Soviet republics, some of whom remain very close to Russia, like Belarus. So if there are any attempts to take action in international fora to try to support Taiwan, uh, it wouldn't be China alone squashing that, it would be Russia and others. So yeah, I think on the margins it would make it more difficult. By 2049, will the U.S. still be the greatest power in the world? I'm actually very optimistic. Um, I believe in, in our system and I believe that the Chinese are going to face a number of difficulties. Uh, I think their economy is in serious trouble. I think um, their, their demographic problems are going to become increasingly clear as a drag on the economy and a drag on the society. I think the uh, increasing authoritarian nature of communist rule there is not going to be well received. Uh, the heavier hand will continue to create uh, some desire for an alternate system of governance in China. Uh, clearly, Xi Jinping has alienated a lot of the elites uh, through his anti-corruption campaign. So I think they're going to be bogged down with a lot of their internal challenges, which doesn't mean they're not 
dangerous or, or risky. Uh, but I, I fundamentally believe in the United States, given all our difficulties and our disunity recently, uh, our, our ability to reinvent, our ability to reemerge is stronger. Uh, if you ask me if this were a poker game, would I rather have the hand that the U.S. is holding or the hand that China's holding? I'd take ours every day of the week, twice on Sunday. You mentioned the economic struggles um, within China. There's some analysts that say that China, in fact, would never invade Taiwan because then that would uh, derail its national rejuvenation, you know, becoming a, a, more, a prosperous society. Mm. What's your view? I think it absolutely would. I mean, even a quote unquote successful invasion of Taiwan, uh, the international reaction I think would be severe. And I think China's already in a precarious uh, economic situation where I think they're more and more reliant on the government supporting and propping up the economy. Uh, I think that would be a pretty devastating uh, chain of events for their economy and really for their country. And as you point out, by 2049, uh, achieving this great national rejuvenization, Yes, they talk about Taiwan as being a part of that, but they also talk about having a world-class military. They also talk about having a strong economy that is self-reliant in key sectors. All of that would be at risk with a bad decision over Taiwan. And yet, those analysts, analysts still insist. They say, in fact, Taiwan is so sacred to, uh, to, to China, a little bit like Ukraine is to Russia, that Xi Jinping would throw all of that out the window? Well, I, I, I would certainly hope not because I don't think Xi Jinping would ultimately succeed. Uh, even a, as I said, successful invasion of Taiwan ultimately would not be to his benefit over the long term. Um, I, I hope it doesn't come to that point. I think if we can keep deterrence strong enough that he wakes up every day and say, today's not the day. Well, I think actually that's good for not only Taiwan, but ultimately I think it's good for the people of China that they wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of that kind of bad decision making. Um, finally, let me quote Mike Gallagher again. He says that we're in an existential struggle over what life will look like in the 21st century and the most fundamental freedoms are at stake. So what sort of world would our grandchildren live in if China actually surpassed the US and became the greatest power? Well, we get glimpses of it in terms of how China is governed internally. Um, we have a de facto police state in uh, throughout the country, but in fact, in p certain portions of the country, we see genocide going on in Xinjiang and um, a, a track record of near genocide in places like Tibet. Uh, one would have to think that if China has more influence, that the world's going to look a lot more like how China's governed and not how we govern in places like the United States and Taiwan. Uh, I think they, you know, their their closest relationships in the world are generally with authoritarian leaders and places where they can capture elites through corruption. Um, I think we could anticipate seeing more and more of that. Um, However, they are a little bit like Russia in the sense that they do have links and loyalty with, let's call them, the global south. China has that too, and, and for them, they have a different perspective. I suspect that has limits to it, and I suspect also that um, that's mainly a function of uh, elite capture. I don't know how well China would poll among the populations in some of those countries. And I think if you look at those that are in the neighborhood and, and live with China's assertive behavior day to day, uh, what do you find? You find that you know a place like Vietnam, the United States polls 94% favorable as a country. China's in the single digits. You look throughout the region, and, and China is a huge trading partner of most countries, but not held in very high regard or, or really any uh, soft power to, sp to speak of, because the face of China is one of aggressiveness, assertiveness, and one that doesn't support other people's sovereignty or really even their interests in a lot of ways. So when I look at the region, I, I would say China's best relationships are about as good as our worst. Um, and, and I think the list is not very long. Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, I, I would even say North Korea. Having spent a little time there, they're not big fans of the, the Chinese either. I think they have no alternative but to, to rely on Chinese support. So they're not doing particularly well in the, in the soft power game in the region. And I would suspect if their influence were to continue to grow globally, we'd see that sort of 
development, uh, even among the countries that you mentioned. Mm. And perhaps that's why they are actually so reliant on Russia. Mm. Mm. So, Grish Shriver, thank you so much for joining Taiwan Talks today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, as we heard there, Mr. Shriver was visiting Taiwan to pay his respects to Ku Guangming, a titan of Taiwan's democracy, to get a first-hand account of Gu, what drove him and what his legacy is today. I spoke with Raymond Song, the deputy CEO of Taiwan New Constitution Foundation, the last think tank that Gu established in the final years of his life. Let's take a look. He was born in 1926 when Taiwan was still under Japanese rule. And he later experienced the taking over of uh, the KMT and the coming of the KMT army and uh, government. And later he experienced the international isolation for Taiwan. And uh, laterally, uh, following that, he experienced the democratization of Taiwan. And uh, so his long life uh, for almost one century really encapsulated what um, Taiwanese experienced under the great shift of uh, historical junctures. And Mr. Ku as a Taiwanese has responded to that uh, with great um, spirit, with great uh, identity of uh, Taiwanese very firm. And you worked very closely with him um, in the last um, five years of his life. What do you think it was that drove him in through some very difficult times in Taiwan's history as he fought for democracy and independence? He fought for Taiwan independence when uh, Taiwan was under white terror, was uh, under dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, for the Taiwanese, they wanted to be respected, to have their power of self-government. We have to remember during those times, they have to pay the price also for financial support and for um, political uh, uh, persuasion and even for greater uh, personal risk. They are the dilemma facing them to whether to fight the KMT, to hold on to their resist resistance to the KMT regime, or to fight for the Taiwanese people as a whole for the greatness, for the goodness of the Taiwanese people. One example came when in 1970s, when the KMT government was exiled, was uh, removed from either the United Nations or their diplomatic tie with Japan and later with the US was severed. Mr. Ku made a major dis, uh, decision then to talk with Chiang Kai-shek, uh, to talk with Chiang Kai-shek's son, Zhang Jingguo for the greater good of the Taiwanese people. He wanted to salvage something, either in terms of uh, diplomatic tie and the commercial tie with Japan. For our international audience, they may be unknowing of the independence movement that you've just spoken about, that Mr. Gu uh, drove forward, which was independence from the, the KMT, from the Chinese nationalists. Uh, so that's a very interesting angle. You also mentioned that, uh, you know, this sort of talk of independence uh, was incredibly dangerous at that time. Uh, now, it is also has a level of danger, um, although perhaps not as much since, you know, separated by the Taiwan Strait from, from Beijing. We fight for one common thing is to get uh, this country being fully accepted as a de jure state on the world stage. We call the normalization of this country. And the one thing is to mention that is to that uh, the uh, situation we are facing now is very different from what Mr. Ku uh, faced in 1960s and 70s. And when Taiwan has its own democracy, but uh, in the sense, the Taiwanese people govern their own fate and own matters now. But internationally, we are not still accepted as a fully independent state. So what are we going to do now? We are going to uh, persuade more people that this is necessary. And uh, no matter what, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese identity has to grow out of the ROC regime. To we the people has to be brave enough to say to the world we are Taiwanese we want a name for our own country we want to be recognized as a Taiwan as such 
we want to have our own constitution. But Raymond, the United States would not support Taiwan's independence. So, you know, where does that leave Taiwan? That's a very diplomatic language. The United States, they, they, uh, it doesn't support Taiwan's independence, but they have the other hand. Um, President Biden and many governmental official also said that Taiwanese people made their own decision. So the card, the ball is uh, really on the court of the Taiwan side. But uh, uh, irrespective of uh, allowing the full expression, um, those has to be balanced on uh, total consideration of uh, Taiwan security about whether it will be uh, going beyond the level which give the excuse an excuse for PRC to attack Taiwan. Of course, this uh, very uh, delicate matter to be handled, and um, it takes um, careful handling and uh, wise uh, measuring and the decision making. Taiwanese people's will has to be balanced with uh, geopolitical considerations. Yes. Most of the polls would indicate that Taiwanese want to keep the status quo, you know, because this seems to be the safest option. Can you tell us why, uh, why we shouldn't, why Taiwan shouldn't be looking to just keep the status quo? That depends on how you define status quo. The not to be ruled by Chinese government and not to have their will be uh, suppressed by uh, force or threatening or coercion. And uh, so that's a peaceful and uh, free and democratic status quo they wanted. And uh, we are arguing that uh, it's all fine, it's all well to keep that. And those are we are also fighting for. But above that, please do not lose aspirations to uh, have what Mr. Ku, our predecessors, have in mind to have a state that we call Taiwan for our own. That should be the ultimate goal. If you say the status quo is that Taiwan has been independent from mainland China for more than 70 years, that's very fine to keep it that way. But we haven't finished the journey. The journey still has to be continued until we are fully accepted into the international community as a state of our own.